I never seem to remember which phase of OTAs is mandatory and which isn't, and that becomes apparent in the first few minutes of today's show. But I'm glad our Chiefs beat writers, Herbie Teopi and Sam McDowell, know the NFL calendar. They're here to describe what happens and the storylines for the Chiefs during this next phase of OTAs on today's Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Stars Daily Sports Podcast. It's Monday, May 24th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. Nationally, the story for the two-time Super Bowl team will be the health of Patrick Mahomes, but Chiefs fans know where that stands. Mahomes has said his recovery is ahead of schedule for the turf toe injury, and he'll be 100% for training camp. Chiefs fans know the biggest stories involve offensive and defensive lines, and we'll begin to get some answers about what the coaches are thinking during this period. We'll also hear from Dalton Schoen, the former Blue Valley Northwest and Kansas State standout wide receiver looking for a roster spot. And in something of an upset, I pronounced Dalton's name correctly, Schoen, after botching it previously. So let's get started with Herbie Teope and Sam McDowell as they preview the next phase of OTAs and what it means for the Chiefs. Herbie Teope and Sam McDowell here, and we are going to talk Chiefs on the, we're at the eve of OTAs, phase three of the OTAs. Um, I believe, Herbie, this is not... Um, voluntary time. Uh, this is the time when they're expected to show up, uh, and so after, you know, after a couple of phases where uh, veterans uh, were not ex- were, were not uh, uh, required to be there. Of course, one of them's rookie minicamp, but uh, but this time veterans are supposed to be there. Well, it is still voluntary. The OTA portion of the offseason workout program remains voluntary. It's the mandatory minicamp that concludes phase three which becomes mandatory appearance. And, you know, they're subject to fines if they don't show up. So for the 10 days of practice on-field sessions that you got coming up here in the next three weeks, that part remains voluntary. All right. So, well, take, take us through the uh, – because every year, I you know, I have to remind myself kind of where we are on the NFL calendar when it comes to these things. This starts Tuesday, um, and it's three days this week. And it, it, include, it concludes in, in mid-June. What's going to happen, happen over the next three weeks? Well, the good thing for here is you're going to have the rookies and veterans combined for on-field workouts, which is something that didn't happen last year during the COVID pandemic, which, of course, is still ongoing. But restrictions are now loosening. You can get these players together on the field, and this is going to be especially beneficial for the young players to incorporate what they're learning in the classroom and apply it on the field. Uh, you can do seven on seven. You can do seven on nine team related drills, 11 on 11. But because of the CBA, there's no contact involved until you get to training camp. So you're going to get a lot of people out there in shorts, helmets, and basically just going through install periods. You know, it's uh, it's spring football, right? Colleges do it. Pros do it. Um, colleges usually are they're way they're done, right? Uh, all the colleges have wrapped up their spring football. NFL is just getting to its um, uh, to the final chapter of, of its spring football period. So every team, and the other thing is, this is whereas in college, everybody has a different starting time and ending time. Uh, NFL, everybody sticks to the same schedule. And so all 32 teams have stories and needs and uh, for the Chiefs, the two time, you know, defending AFC champion. Um, what what are the what are the storylines here, Sam? What are what are some of the things that we're, we're going to be most interested in seeing with this Chiefs team? I guess maybe a good place to start is what Patrick Mahomes will be wearing on his foot. Yeah, I mean, the Mahomes thing is is obviously something to monitor, but he's he's going to be good to go by training camp, and that's what's important. Um, regardless of what he does this week or, or any of these three-day periods over the next month, I mean, he's going to – Brett Veach and Andy Reid have, have told us multiple times that he's ahead of schedule in that rehab from the toe injury, which already would have placed him to return by training camp. So um, I think we'll probably see him on the field some, but probably not to the full extent. Uh, to me, the biggest thing to monitor, because the thing I'm most interested in is uh, it, it's obviously early and there's a lot of time to change this. But I'm interested to see who lines up where on the offensive line and who lines up with whom on the offensive line. Um, you know, who's part of that first string right now? Is it Lucas Niang or Mike Rimmers on, at right tackle? 
Um, you know, is it Creed Humphrey or Austin, Austin Blythe at center? Uh, is, is it Kyle Long or uh, Duvernay Tardif at right guard? Th those are the, the, the things that I'm most interested in because that's the storyline of this offseason is what they've done on the offensive line. So um, we can project it out, but I'd like to see how they're projecting it out right now here in May. Yeah, to look, piggyback off of what Sam said there on Mahomes, you know, Reed and Beach basically reinforced what Mahomes said, you know, coming straight out of his mouth. What was that last month before the draft? Hey, I am ahead of schedule. So, you know, the storylines that are popping up in the last week or so, not that I'm crapping on other media outlets, but, you know, it's nothing new because Mahomes specifically said I'm ahead of schedule. Veach said shortly thereafter that he's expected to do some stuff. Uh, so it was nothing new to report there. It was, it was something that we already knew coming into the OTA period. Right. So uh, let's, we'll stay at quarterback for a second. Um, who, Chad Henney's the backup. And as we learned uh, in last year's playoffs, it, it's worthwhile for him to get snaps uh, when, when he can get them. Right. And as we saw in the, you know, the second half of the, of the divisional round victory over the Cleveland Browns, how, you know, how he seemed to, uh, replace the injured Mahomes almost seamlessly and, and help the Chiefs get that W. I assume he's the next man up, right? If uh, we, he'll he'll be getting he'll be getting the snaps that Mahomes doesn't get. Yeah, and then here's the interesting thing about this because the, the Chiefs right now have four quarterbacks on the roster outside of Mahomes. You do have Henny, you have Anthony Gordon, and you have Shane Shane Buesler. Buesler. I always kill his last name. <laughs> Bouchel. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> But you have enough arms where you can run your first team, second team, third team. And if Mahomes is going to be participating in some level, you know, maybe it's, it's more or less individual position drills. But the Chiefs are not going to put him in harm's way until he's 100 percent ready. And Mahomes has even said that he hoped to do something by the end of the offseason, which would mean he's probably looking at either the end of mandatory minicamp or training camp. But, you know, the bottom line is he will be ready by camp. Your uh, your Bouchel is my Dalton Schoen. I've been calling him Shane for years, and I just think I don't know why. I, I don't know why. Just stupid. Uh, and we will uh, we'll actually hear from Dalton Schoen later in the show, and I want to talk about him too. With Sam, I wrote a good story about him. Um, let's go back to the offensive line though for a second. Um, uh, you know the the offensive line that you might see initially may not be the one that you you see at the at the you know, in, during training camp and and day one. So. Uh, but there are a lot of – there seems to be some depth there that, that wasn't there at, uh, you know, in, during the playoffs after Eric Fisher went down and, uh, and other issues cropped up for the Chiefs. At least there seems to be some depth there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as much as the, they've overhauled the starting group, which, which could be five guys by the time the season opener rolls around compared to what they, they ended the Super Bowl with, um, but I, I do think that the bigger thing is they have contingency plans that they didn't have in place last year. Um, I, I mean, you know, Mike Rimmers ended up having to play left tackle when Eric Fisher got hurt. Uh, you know, Nick Allegretti had to play left guard. Uh, uh, Andrew Wiley ended up at right tackle. Um, so, you know, that Daniel Kilgore ended up at center when Austin Ryder took a couple games and Daniel Kilgore was out of the league. Steve Wisniewski played guard in the Super Bowl, and he's out of the league. And the other guys that have played, I am struggling to find roster spots for them. You know, when you look at, like, the Andrew Wileys and Nick Allegretti's, I'm wondering, are they going to make the initial 53 uh, at a training camp? And that's, that's because of what you mentioned, Blair, and that, that's because of the depth that they've added at those spots, which is why, you know, you mentioned, I mean, it's super early. To, I mean, whatever we see out there is not necessarily going to be the starting group, but I do think it gives us some indication of how they project that this group might line up. So that that's why that's what I'm most interested in seeing out at this camp. Sam brings up a very good point there because you know, they are, you, you can probably expect Andy Reid and Andy Heck to rotate the personnel uh, starting now into camp. You know, this the, the offensive line is, is probably projects to remain fluid up to camp with the exception of two positions, the left tackle, which Orlando Brown is probably going to man. Well, he will, man. You don't trade for him and move him over to the center position. And also Joe Tooney, you don't sign him to a five-year massive mega million deal if he's not your guy at left guard. So the three positions that are clearly up in the air center, right, right guard and right tackle. 
the key thing with the coaching staff right now is these players are not in pads. And this is something that, you know, media, we have to train ourselves to understand that as well, because when you look at OTAs and you're trying to evaluate it, the one positions or the two positions that are really going to jump out at you are quarterbacks and the wide receivers, you know, because they should look good when you're basically going against air. But when you've got the interior defensive line, the offensive line, the defensive players, they're not in full pads and no contact is allowed. So when you've got the pulling guard, you know, it, it looks like he's opening up a massive hole. You got to keep in mind that defensive lineman can't blow him up or the linebacker can't come around there and give him a nice little crack. Uh, so, you know, there's some of the things we have to keep in mind when we go into OTAs. There's an all pro team, but there's no such thing as an all OTA team. <laughs> yeah, you know, Andy Reid actually said something about that when we were asking about Lucas Niang, about how, you know, it's, yeah, he looked good out there, and but it, I mean, you can't really judge because the the defensive linemen and offensive linemen aren't engaging out there. So, um, I, I'm more interested to see where they line up than I am to see sit there and judge, you know, how how they're performing at these camps. Hey, Sam, you mentioned some names just a moment ago that I'd forgotten. You know, it's that's how that's how much we have talked and considered the offensive line changes that. God, Daniel Kilgore. He started a handful of games last season, and uh, a couple of guy, a couple of others. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, he was with the Chiefs too. That I, I am absolutely not expecting to be back with the Chiefs. Yeah, there's there's probably some names on there that that some people listening on here would like to forget as well. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but not not having forgot the performance. I mean, that, that's what uh, that's what prompted all of this. Right. You didn't even mention your Mizzou guy, Sam. I mean, you're a Mizzou alum. What, what about Yasser Durant? I don't know that Durant has a place on uh, the initial 53, but but he, he's got some practice squad eligibility. There we go. There we go. Um, you know, rush end is another position that uh, that I, I think it'll be curious to see who, who lines up and, um, and, and who, who's running with the twos, that sort of thing. Break it down a little bit, Herbie, about, uh, with, with rush end. Yeah, I think um, right now the Chiefs are in the search for a complimentary piece for, uh, I almost said Alex Okafor, for Frank Clark. You know, you Tano Passanio and Alex Okafor are gone. Uh, and you've got Taco Charlton, who they resigned to a one-year deal. You've got Mike Dana, their rookie from last year, now entering his second year. And they spent a fourth-round draft pick on Joshua Cando. I, I, it's going to be interesting to see how that rotation plays out because they do need a consistent complimentary piece to Clark. The thing to me that really stands out here in, in OTAs, and Sam and I will probably be discussing this till, till the cows come home, you know, when you sign a guy like Jaron Reed, you give them a lot of flexibility inside. Now, I can't see Chris Jones kicking out every down, but there are going to be certain sub packages where you probably will see Jones lining up as a defensive end opposite of Clark. And that, to me, is going to be the fascinating piece of how they set the edge starting in OTAs. Maybe we'll hear from Chris Jones and some other Chiefs. I know we'll hear from other Chiefs later in the week. Looking looking forward to that. And Herbie, you just said it a while ago. It's so true. Um, because of the limited contact, wide receivers, this is their time, right? I mean, this is the time for wide receivers just to look great. It is uh, – they live for this. And there have been some – uh, some all OTA wide receivers over the years that you never heard from again. Um, but – the Chiefs still have a question or two at that position. Um, what are they going to? What's the what's the objective here for for the Chiefs at that position? Competition. You know, we know Tyree Kill is a given, and we need to figure out. Well, the Chiefs need to figure out who is the bona fide number two, who's the number three. I mean, they they have to establish some kind of pecking order starting in. O during OTAs, you've got Demarcus Robinson coming back. McCole Hardman, he is entering a very important third season. He's got to show some signs of progression. You've got a, a K-Stater and Byron Pringle who has drawn praise from, from Brett Veach. And you've got Colin, Colin, good Lord, Cornell Powell, uh, their fifth-round draft pick, who's also in the mix. The, the player that I think is going to be interesting to really watch, and because Veach has, has mentioned him at least two times during this offseason, is the former Cleveland Browns fourth round draft pick Antonio Callaway. He, he's, he signed, uh, I believe, a reserve future deal, and the Chiefs apparently are, are pretty high on him. So, you know, that, that's a player we're probably going to have to watch as well. 
Yeah, there, there's somebody in the mix here that the, the Chiefs are giving more confidence in than I think maybe we have so far. And maybe that is Byron Pringle. Maybe that is Powell, their fifth round pick. Uh, maybe it is a guy like Callaway, but you know we look at this this depth chart and compare it to recent well Patrick with recent Patrick Mahomes seasons, and the absence of Sammy Watkins lends you to believe that they they need to replace that guy and they haven't. But they might be thinking that that Byron Pringle can be that guy. I mean, there's there's somebody on this roster that was on this roster last year that's suddenly be, going to be getting a lot more snaps with the way the depth chart's currently constructed. And I believe that we have not heard the last of uh, Herbie confusing uh, Cordell Powell and Colin Powell. I, uh, <laughs> hey, thank God for editors, because I'm pretty sure I filed stories with Colin Powell. <laughs> the best thing is he he has admitted to me in text messages several times that he's going to do this, and yet he still does it. Like, it's a <laughs> conscious thing. He knows he screws it up, and he still does it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and as I mentioned earlier, um, Dalton Schoen is somebody whose <laughs> name I have screwed up, and his brother Mason. You know, I, I the whole family I've totally yeah. disrespected. So, yeah. uh, my apologies to to the Schoen family. Let's talk about him for a second. I uh, he he met the media during the last Chiefs availability, and we'll hear from him after a break. But uh, uh, what a nice story, and certainly a long shot to to be a Chief, but. But, uh, Sam, you wrote about him, local kid, uh, former teammate of Byron Pringle at, at Kansas State. And, look, he's a good player. He's a solid college wide receiver. Kansas State sure could have used him last year. Uh, um, but, uh, but, but uh, look, he's a guy you pull for, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's the type of guy to where you wish uh, the most talented guys in your roster had the sort of attitude that he brings. Um, and, and and I do think that, uh, you know, he was at rookie minicamp, but he's a second-year guy technically. He just didn't make the Chargers roster last year at a training camp as an undrafted free agent. Um, but I do think he, he's the sort of guy that probably set a good example in that locker room, even though he hadn't been in the locker room during a, a, a full season yet, just because, you know, he's got this – you know, I want to learn everything about special teams roles. And, you know, I want to learn everything that I would have to do to make this team. And there's some guys that probably are more talented than Dalton um, that if they take on that mi mindset, they could potentially crack a roster. Um, but, uh, you know, the first time I ever talked to Dalton was he, he won our Kansas City Scholar Athlete in 2015. And I, I wrote – I was doing high schools back then. So I, I wrote the, the feature on Dalton and I, I was blown away by, I mean, you always are. I mean, Blair, you've been here for a long yeah. time and you always read those resumes as well. You're just blown away by, by how impressive some of these kids are, particularly the winners and, and Dalton certainly fit that category. I mean, his parents had some amazing stories about the things that he used to do. He was a three sport athlete at Blue Valley Northwest. Um, but you know, I, I, I remember I went back and read it whenever I wrote the story on him. He was a kid that um, when he was really young, the referees told him <clears throat> in soccer, which was not one of his three high school sports, uh, he was only allowed to score left footed because that was the only way they could, they could even the, the playing field uh, for little league soccer. That's the kind of athlete that that kid's just always been. Great story. That's a case stater. That's a great story. Yeah, and I, and I mentioned his brother. His brother was a co-captain of the the tw Mason, the 2018 K State team that went to the regional final. So, um, a lot of good um, uh, Kansas State athletic memories with 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 the Shones. I remember when he when Shone was his first full year with the team, catching an 82 yard touchdown pass against Texas, um, right down the middle. Uh, in fact, I was watching we were in town i think we were in houston the night before chiefs game watching the, the wildcats play texas and dalton split the defense and um and, and made a big play so yeah you know, that's uh, the one other thing blair that I, I i just completely left out of that story is that the guy was a walk-on at k-state i mean he did not have any division one offers and so that shows his work ethic he just he loved bill snyder growing up wanted to go play for bill snyder at some point in his life and within by his sophomore year, he was a part of the, the receiver rotation. And so, you know, we call him a long shot and he absolutely is a long shot to make this, this team, but uh, he's been here before and, and proved us all wrong before. And so that that's the mindset he's taken into all this stuff. You will hear from Dalton, uh, Dalton after we take a break and we're going to bid farewell to Herbie Teope and Sam McDowell. Uh, good conversation guys. And we'll, we'll talk again sometime next week. 
All right, thanks, Blair. Thanks, Blair. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Hey, Dalton. Um, a, a couple things here, but I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, being a walk-on in college, was this ever part of the goal? I mean, did you think that this was realistic? Um, I mean, starting out my college career, I would probably say no. You know, going to K-State was a dream come true for me. Uh, my first goal going there, though, was just to get on the field. Um, I was fighting for a job on special teams, stuff like that. Going into my sophomore year, you know, I was just trying to earn a spot on all those. But then all of a sudden, you know, kind of got in the mix there at receiver, ended up starting as a sophomore. So then all of a sudden, you know, your goals get a little bit higher. Um, and going through my whole career there, though, I was really focusing on being the best I could be there. Um, kind of got to that senior year, into my senior year point, and, Gave it my all preparing for pro day. Um, and now to be here is just a true dream. And I, I, I'm wondering if that experience helps you in this experience. You know, you get there and you're obviously not thought of as the highly touted recruit. And then you get here as an undrafted guy. I mean, does, does, is there similarities there that you can draw from? Definitely. It's the exact same mindset. I mean, you hit it right on the head. Going in there as a walk-on and being here you're, as an undrafted free agent, you know, you're instantly kind of thrown to the bottom of the totem pole. You got to just have that mindset that you're a street dog. You're going to show up. You're going to fight every day. You're going to do the things most other guys don't want to do or won't do. Um, and you kind of just got to keep fighting until you get the opportunity to prove yourself. Okay, Herbie. <laughs> hey, Dalton, uh, obviously you went to K-State. Byron Pringle went to K-State. How often are you all in each other's ears? And was he one of the first people to reach out to you when you decided to sign here? Definitely, yeah. No, me and B were good buddies at K-State. We started together in uh, 2017. Um, he texted me instantly right away, right when he saw that I signed, you know, said, hit me up if you have any questions about the playbook. Um, he's in town weekend, you know, I was like, hey, let's hit the field, stuff like that. He's been back in Tampa most of the time, so we haven't been t- together, you know, working out much or anything like that. But uh, we've definitely been in contact, you know, uh, he's been helping me out. We'll go next to Haley Lewis. Go ahead, Haley. I asked Niang this earlier, but just kind of wanted to ask the difference between your college workouts and an Andy Reid workout now that you've had a little bit of the, you know, Chiefs Kingdom taste in your mouth. Yeah, I mean, I think at the pro level, everything kind of just moves a little bit faster. Um, college, you know, I think you take a little bit more time to slowly go through things or, um, I mean, really talk it through before maybe you run the play. Now here at this level, maybe you've talked about something one, one time or maybe you were expected to just look over it yourself and know how to run the play full speed, you know, full go. Um, with that being said, I think Coach Reed does a great job of making corrections on the field and making sure we get it right um, in the moment. Let's go next to Matt Derrick. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, Dalton, I'm just curious. Uh, Two-part question. You know, one, how did everything go this weekend? How big of a deal was it for you to be out there? It looked like you had a nice uh, sliding catch on Friday. And, and then, two, just what is the experience of, you know, being in Kansas City and being close to, you know, where you went to college and knowing that you got friends and, and probably his family watching you? Yeah. Um, so to your first question, you know, I thought the weekend re- went really well. Um, felt great just to be back out in a full live practice setting. Um, felt great to finally go out and run the routes that, you know, I've been learning virtually for a few weeks now. Um, and so that was a really good weekend, I thought. Uh, and then being from Kansas City, uh, being close to my college, K-State, it's a dream come true, like I said earlier, and it's just so cool. Um, so like you kind of said, have so many people pulling for me, you know, I'll run into people randomly or people will just text me if they see I post on Instagram, something like that. And they say, hey, man, like we're pulling for you. Everyone's rooting for you. So to know I have all that support from all these people who I haven't even talked to for some of them in a long time, to know they're all supporting me and rooting for me and behind me, it means a lot. We got three more. We'll go right from the top. Harold, you're up. Hey, Dalton, I mean, you're representing Blue Valley Northwest, too. So, you know, how, how much have you heard from your high school buddies? Like, oh, my gosh, you're, you're a Kansas City Chief. That's pretty cool. And then just learning with the receivers. How's that been, you know, learning from some of the other guys that you're also competing with spots against, but also just learning what they've done and what college experiences they went through? For sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's so awesome to represent Blue Valley Northwest. Um 
being from this area and now to be here in mini camp is just so cool. Like you said, I've had so many high school teammates, uh, just random people I knew in high school, teachers all reach out to me and just, you know, again, show their support for me and say, hey, it's so cool that you're doing this, all this stuff. Um, and then in terms of the other receivers, um, yeah, it's been great getting to know some of them. Like we mentioned earlier, I knew Byron Pringle from college. Um, the gym I work out at in Overland Park, uh, Gary Dieter works out there too. And so we've been on the field doing a lot of routes and stuff. He's been so helpful to me, you know, talking me through routes, doing all this stuff to get me ready for this mini camp. So that's huge. Let's go next to Sam McDowell. Go ahead, Sam. Hey, Dalton, I also just wanted to ask about um, going through COVID last year, how much you felt like that hurt somebody in your position trying to make an impression? Yeah, I think it hurt a lot. Um, starting with the fact that we didn't really have these mini camps and off season program last year, it was all virtual. So, you know, I was sitting at home um, on roster with the chargers. I'm trying to learn everything virtually. Um, I thought I handled that pretty well though. We got out there for camp and it all seemed to go pretty well. I mean, I, I felt like I had a great camp. Uh, didn't, couldn't really be sad about anything. I, you know, I got cut at the end of it because it just sucked not having preseason games um, and stuff like that. Never really had a good opportunity to prove myself and, you know, rise above other guys, you know, they just kind of left it stagnant. But at the end of the day, I left there thinking I had a great camp. I did everything I could. It just didn't work out. And then it made it tough um, last year during the season, too, just because teams couldn't really do a whole lot of workouts or there was a lot of um, protocols and strict rules on that. So that also made things tough. And we'll last to Neil Jones. Go ahead, Neil. Dalton, are, what are your favorite memories of watching the Chiefs growing up here in the Kansas City area? Were there players you emulated or, or do you have a, a game you went to? Do you remember any of that? Um, honestly, I remember growing up and the Chiefs weren't so good. Um, and so that's kind of what makes it so cool to be here now. I, I grew up and, you know, there were some trying years. And then I remember when they hired Coach Reed and turned things around. Um, those first years with Alex Smith, you know, that huge comeback when they had that one year. Um, and then when they got Tyreek and Kelsey and all these guys, I remember seeing a preseason game when Kelsey, I think, was a brand new tight end. And he caught like a 60 yard touchdown. And I was like, that guy's going to be somebody. Um, and then here we are years later. And it's just really cool that now I'm here in this building. That will do it for today. Thanks to our Sportsbeat KC production staff of Derek Donovan, Beth Welsh, Monty Davis, Jeff Rosen, Chris Pickett, and Savannah Smith. Tip of the cap to Sam McDowell and Herbie Teope for stopping by and talking Chiefs and OTAs. Links to their stories can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, got another deal for you. You can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. Sports Pass is the online version of the Star Sports section. You get all the stories that appear in the print editions of the Star, plus more that appear only on the website, and of course they appear first on KansasCity.com. After three months, it auto renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. And it's always a great time to subscribe. Read about what's going on with the Chiefs, the Royals. Gosh, the Royals just took two out of three from the Tigers and now on their way to Tampa Bay. You got the colleges, Mizzou softball team heading to the Super Regional, the soccer teams, Sporting KC and KC NWS, NWSL off coming off uh, a good weekend. How do you get this? You go to KansasCity.com slash SportsPass2020. That's KansasCity.com slash SportsPass2020. Do you want more than just sports coverage? Check out the entire Kansas City Star product, sports news features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional national news, sports, and business coverage with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. And if you're having trouble hunting down any of those offers, you just send me an email, bkirkoff, that's K-E-R-K-H-O-F-F, at kcstar.com, bkirkoff at kcstar.com. I'll get you to the right place. So... Whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Tuesday talking Royals on Sports BKC. Sports BKC.